So first up, um, I think there's really three main micronutrient deficiencies that I want to talk about for a couple of reasons. One, because they're widespread um, prevalence in terms of either deficiency or inadequacy. And two, because I think they played a very important role in a lot of physiological processes in our body that affect the way we age. So first, we're going to talk about vitamin D. And most of you guys probably have already heard enough about vitamin D, but um, it, it's important to talk about because it's, it's more than a vitamin. So vitamin D gets converted into a steroid hormone and it goes into the nucleus of cells and interacts with DNA. So it recognizes a very specific sequence of DNA called the vitamin D response element. And, and this is encoded in our DNA. Um, and that interaction then either turns genes on and activates them, or it does the opposite. It sort of turns them down and represses them. So it's very important for orchestrating. I mean, we're talking about over 5% of the protein encoding human genome is regulated by vitamin D, which is quite a lot. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine if, if you're running a car and your pistons are, are firing um, out of sync with each other, I mean, that's kind of what's happening when you, when you don't have adequate levels of vitamin D. Your genes aren't being regulated in the way they're supposed to be. So things aren't being activated when they're supposed to be or repressed when they're supposed to be. So things are kind of, you know, going, going awry. Um, and as I mentioned about it, it, it's widespread prevalency in terms of inadequacy. So about 70% of the population has inadequate levels of vitamin D, which we'll talk about in a minute. It's about 30 nanograms per milliliter or less. And it's a very simple solution. And that's also why I like to talk about it because um, it, it, it's almost just as simple as taking a, a, basically a supplement that costs a penny a pill. Vitamin D supplements are one of the most affordable supplements out there. And, and there's really just no reason other than lack of you know education about vitamin d for people to be so deficient and insufficient a lot of reasons for the widespread deficiency um you know we make vitamin d3 in our skin so uvb radiation is essential to make vitamin d3 anything that blocks out uvb radiation is going to stop that production of vitamin d so we're talking sunscreen um, melanin, which is the dark skin pigmentation that protects us from the burning rays of the sun, um, also is a natural sunscreen. So that is also a form of sunscreen. Uh, also, depending on where you live, so in northern latitude, um, UVB radiation can't even reach the atmosphere, you know, several months out of the year. So when you combine some of these factors, let's say you take someone with darker pigmentation from, let's say, East Asia, and they move somewhere like Chicago, or they move to Sweden, where you know six months out of the year you're not even getting that UVB radiation. You're talking about just a you know compounding effect on vitamin D deficiency because um, you know there have been studies out of the University of Chicago that have shown that, for example, African Americans have to stay in the sun anywhere between six to ten times longer than Caucasians with fair skin to make the same amount of vitamin D3 in their skin. So you're talking, I mean, it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's a compounding effect with respect to, to, the, to the melanin production as well. And then age plays a role. So as we age, you know, everything is less efficient. Um, so, you know, a 70 year old makes about, I think it's four times less vitamin D3 in their skin than their former 20 year old self. So, and then of course, modern day societies so that we have we're inside, indoors, we're at our computers, we're in our cubicles, we're technology, you know, we're not out, we're, it's, it's not an agricultural society. We're not outside, you know, as, as much as we used to be. And so um, vitamin D is just not being made in our skins like it was 100 years ago. So there's a lot of reasons why it's, it's widespread. Um, I like to show this, this slide. It was a study published several years ago, it was 2009. And, and it's, it's showing um, when you knock out the vitamin D receptor in, in mice that it affects the way they age. Um, so at the top of the panel, you can see that both mice, that wild type and then the vitamin D receptor knockout, sort of aging the same. And then four months later, the vitamin D receptor mouse is, is just, it's an it's a accelerated aging model. And, you know, yeah, it looks terrible, but like the organs on, on every level, things were... Um, it sort of accelerated in the way they were aging. 
So um, it's, it's just kind of a nice visual to see. But of course, we're not mice. And I've always often wondered why mice even need vitamin D because, you know, they're nocturnal. and they have, It's just one of those things where it's like, I don't know how much of that actually translates to humans. So let's talk about some human studies. Um, we know that there's a lot of data out there, observational data that's correlated vitamin D levels to low vitamin D levels to higher all-cause mortality risk, higher uh, cancer mortality. But there's always that question of healthy user bias. Maybe people with higher vitamin D are outside and more physically active. And of course, you try to correct for as many con you know, confounding factors as possible, but you never really can establish causation. That's where Mendelian randomization comes into play. So this is we, you know, we have a variety of genes that are responsible for converting vitamin D3 into 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is the um, most, you know, active circulating form of vitamin D, and then subsequently into the steroid hormone, which is 125-hydroxy vitamin D. Um, some of these genes that make enzymes, we all are different, and so some people have ones that don't do it as efficiently. Um, and so Mendelian randomization takes these genes, these, these single nucleotide polymorphisms in these genes and says, okay, we're going to randomize them. People that have these genes that we know make them basically have lower levels of 25-hydroxy vitamin D and see what their, you know, correlate that to health outcomes like all-cause mortality. So it's kind of in a way, a way of randomizing people. And people that have genetically low vitamin D levels, independent of what their lifestyle is they have a much higher all-cause mortality, they have a higher cancer-related mortality, and they have a higher respiratory disease mortality um, with very little or no effect on cardiovascular mortality. <clears throat> and there's also been, um, with randomized controlled trials, obviously you're not going to have a lifelong randomized controlled trial looking at mortality, but there's, you know, there's other biomarkers that can be looked at. One is epigenetic aging, which I'm sure you guys heard about yesterday. So um, one study that took people that were vitamin D deficient, and that's, it's important to, to start out with a cohort of participants that are deficient, right? Because if you already have someone that's sufficient, giving them a vitamin D supplement really shouldn't do much because they're already at a sufficient level. So um, these were African-American individuals that were also overweight. And um, so they were, they were very vitamin D deficient. They were given a vitamin D supplement with 4,000 IUs of vitamin D a day, and it decreased their epigenetic age by almost two years. So the question is, what is deficiency, insufficiency, um, adequacy? Uh, so technically, it's kind of, I, I would say, depending on what institute you're looking at, but the um, Endocrinology Institute defines deficiency as vitamin, 25-hydroxy uh, vitamin D levels, less than 20 nanograms per mil. Sufficiency is about 30, getting, you know, so if you're insufficient, you're less than 30, but if you're sufficient, you're more than 30. And it seems as though the sweet spot for vitamin D is between 40 to 60 nanograms per milliliter. And, um, you know, there's, there's all-cause mortality studies also looking at vitamin D levels. There's meta-analyses of these you know, ranging for, from 1960s all the way to the, you know, mid, like 2015. And it's, it's really, it seems like 40 to 60 is a really good sweet spot for the lowest all-cause mortality with vitamin D. As I mentioned, 4,000, I mentioned 4,000 I used a vitamin D a day because um, that's the, the tolerable upper intake for vitamin D. So it's quite safe. And um, in general, 1,000 I use a vitamin D generally raises people's blood levels by about five nanograms per mil. So the key is to just get, get a vitamin D blood test. Do it, you know, after you're supplementing, make, make sure your, your levels are adequate because, again, a lot of these single nucleotide polymorphisms in genes that affect our enzymes that are metabolizing vitamin D also affect how we respond to um, supplemental vitamin D. And some people can require a much higher dose than other people. So really the key here is blood test and measuring. Um, you don't know what you don't measure, right? <clears throat>